Um, so good to be back, and, and I'm really glad that this question was asked. Um, and it's really important that together we think forward we, so that we can make the most of the opportunities that are coming. Um, but also, I think too often people do so in a sort of uh, intuitive or random way. And what I'd like to do just for the, for the first sort of five minutes that I'm talking and before other um, panel members come up, I'd like to um, get a bit analytical. I'd like to really think about what's happened in the past and what's made the biggest impact in terms of technology and how we live today in order to understand what might be coming, but also to anticipate what are going to be the influential trends that determine uh, the actual impact of those technologies. So um, I think I can... No. So to create the future, we must understand the past. So I'd like to go back in history and quickly have a look at what are the things that have made the biggest difference to us. 100 BC, first time we invented paper, a way to permanently store messages. 1445, a way to mass produce information and disseminate it. 1816, the ability to capture an image. 1877, the ability to capture and reproduce and disseminate audio. Now, also be paying attention to what's happening on the time scale here, because it is compressing. Video camera, capturing moving image. So the media is getting richer. 1937, we went digital with audio first. And then we built the machines that can manipulate that digital information. Perfect reproduction and dissemination. 1973, we went mobile. So the information that we're sharing and bringing to, uh, to one another can actually be um, realized and harvested at the point that we need it. In this case, originally, it was just audio communication. Then it went to digital cameras. So this ability, again, to digitally manipulate then it became personal. Then it wasn't just something that was in, in big companies and offices. It was something we could do in our homes. Masses of information being able to be archived. Digital video in 1986. 1992, the internet, so that we can uh, share this information across the world uh, in uh, an instant. And then the first web-enabled mobile phone in 1996, so that uh, we can access all of this rich media information at the point and time of need. So before we go and have a look at what's coming, and I do have that, I would like to also look at another few analytic data points to work out where we might be going. First of all, we know about Moore's law, that the number of transistors on integrated circuits roughly doubles every two years. You'll see that the scale on the vertical axis there is actually exponential. So the fact we have a linear trend, for instance, that we only had a couple of thousand um, transistors on a uh, chip back in 1970, and now we've got sort of 20 billion, means that where this technology and its capacity is increasing exponentially. If you look at um, the Horizon reports that have been released over the last de decade as an indicator of where we might be going, I'll give you just actually uh, just 30 seconds to see if you can spot any trends in that data. So this is looking at um, the Horizon reports and the things that the different Horizon reports, which make predictions about the um, influential educational technologies in the next year, the next two to three years, and the next four to five years. Does anyone want to shout out sort of a, a trend that they notice or something interesting that they see? Maybe people are a little shy. I'll point to a couple for you. First of all, you've got sometimes that a technology will just, it won't go from four to five years and, and then up to one year gradually. Something like in 2013, massive open online courses burst into the scene, wasn't predicted, and it's there just for that one year. 
But in other times, if you look at 2011, two to three years, you've got augmented reality. And then in 2016 again, they're saying, well, still in two to three years, augmented and virtual reality. And then in 2018, you've got mixed reality is now four to five years away. So there's some different trends going on here. How do we make sense of these trends? And um, I think there's two different ways that we can explain those two different sort of temporal phenomena. The first is Gartner's hype cycle, that we have this tendency in technology and often in education correspondingly to initially say, oh, wow, this is the greatest new thing and it's going to trend. Everything is going to be, for instance, MOOCs. And then we come to this trough of disillusionment a bit later where we realize, oh, actually, MOOCs aren't going to change everything. And in fact, they're not that great. But then after a while, we realize, oh, actually, yes, MOOCs can be used and they fit into our ecosystem in this particular position rather than overtaking everything we reach this plateau of productivity. But another thing that happens is that, um, according to Rogers' diffusion of innovation theory, and I think this is probably the most important one to pay attention to, is that we have um, this curve of adopters. Your innovators, your top 2.5%, they're going to be straight onto your new technologies. And your early adopters will follow soon uh, uh, later. And the early majority will um, up to sort of the top half of the population will use it um, in, in a reasonable time after it emerged. But you've always got this late majority and always got these laggards. So even though augmented reality technology has been around for quite a while, it's not infiltrating into every classroom. So really the integration and what the classroom of 2030 is going to look like doesn't primarily or just depend on technology. It really depends mainly on teachers. So in thinking about what the future of technology will involve, um, I think AR and VR and AI coming together are pretty safe bets. If you think about the trends we looked at at the beginning of that timeline, it was always technologies that were richer, that brought information closer to us, uh, and that were able to disseminate learning uh, in, in effective ways that were the technology transformations that were having the biggest impact on our world. And the advent of artificial intelligence, the computing power to make um, uh, AR and VR much more complex, uh, complex and personalized to the learner um, is going to be incredibly important. So um, we've seen some examples of AR uh, and VR and artificial intelligence is another one that's hard to provide examples for, but I've scattered it throughout these future trends that I'd um, like to um, propose as what we should be really looking out for. So with AR, we're going to have more intelligent input recognition, temperature, smell, voice, um, gesture detection, leap motion, more sophisticated output types, so complex 3D interactive mo uh, models, scripts to network devices, and the, um, the actual devices themselves will become more intelligent, uh, input and output. So they already have um, contact lenses that uh, are AR, that you can put them in and they use it for diabetes to give you an indicator of when your blood sugars might be low. And pardon some of these um, graphics, they're things that I've sort of um, doctored up. Um, but the idea that when we put 3D models and uh, artificial intelligence uh, together, so more interactive and AR, that we may be able to simulate future realities um, and toggle switches to see what the outcomes would have been uh, under different circumstances. For instance, here's a Battle of Gettysburg uh, simulation using 3D models, um, AI and AR. In the classroom of the future, we may have facial recognition, student tracking, where the teacher can just scan around the class and see what students' needs are and where they're up to. Um, what their past performance is, what their needs might be. We'll most likely have de de devices merging <laughs> seamlessly into our world. So, um, and this is just a sort of a little snapshot. I'll play a little bit of this video um, to give you a, a little bit of a taste of what that might look like.
So, so that goes on for quite a while. But the idea that really, and it's happening in our world already, right? That we've got input and out dev output devices all around us. And that's going to continue to increase. Um, and other trends that um, artificial intelligence is helping us to get towards is videogrammetry. Uh, and I think that's going to be really exciting in terms of uh, enabling people to participate in a learning experience from wherever they are. So videogrammetry is the art of using cameras in order to, in real time, create 3D models. So, We contribute a new algorithm for live multi-view performance capture that generates compelling high quality reconstructions of non-rigid motion and shape in real time. Our system takes noisy input from multiple cameras, in this case eight depth cameras, and produces a temporally consistent 3D model in real time. This model can additionally be textured with the RGB data. So they've actually created the a 3D rendering. Um, so the potential of that in terms of being able to put us in a different learning experience so we're all together um, is going to be tremendous. Because my personal um, uh, vision and one of my uh, motivations is to enable anytime, anywhere access to learning for people right across the world. Um, maybe you could be in a refugee camp in uh, Syria and still have the same access to education. So this was the basis of a blended synchronous learning project that uh, my colleagues and I in Australia um, ran. If you're interested in some of the other case studies, you can go to blendsync.org um, and download the free report. Um, but this was a blended reality environment that we created where, um, well, I'll play the video to provide the clearest indication. Office of Learning and Teaching Blended Synchronous Learning Project, we've been investigating how to unite remote and face-to-face -face learners in the same live experience using the Avaya Live Engage virtual world. Where students in the face-to-face -face classroom can see and hear remote students' avatars via a projection of the virtual world. And remote students can see and hear their face-to-face -face peers via a video stream into that virtual environment. We're not only able to have remote and on-campus students experience the same live teacher presentation, but also participate in group work and whole class report back activities. This enabled students in both environments to share their ideas and discuss them, almost as though they were in the same class. So ideally in the future, the technology will just become invisible so that remote and face-to-face -face students develop the same sense of co-presence. Until then, blended reality, the synchronous blending of augmented reality and augmented virtuality environments can be used to take us in that direction. So in conclusion, I think that we've got um, a lot of uh, quite incredible technologies coming uh, our way, but the educational benefit of those technologies is very much going to depend on how uh, we as teachers conceptualize it and integrate it uh, and are prepared to use it. So, um, so thank you very much. And, yep, and I'll now introduce um, the next panelist. Now, did you want me to... Uh, have everyone up on stage first, Richie. Would that be the best? Or uh, okay, uh, is that is, would would you prefer to individual. individual, and then we'll sit down maybe for a for a panel. Okay, so um, could I please invite then her excellent her excellency Paula Parvarian to um, the ambassador from the Republic of Finland uh, to Singapore um, to provide some visions for 2030 for the classroom. Thank you, 